everybody. Good evening, good evening. Good to be with you this evening. Come on in. God bless you. God bless you. Feel like that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the better live performances I've ever heard on the internet <laughs> A woman singing to God for her friend As she prepares for her wedding singing to God for her friend, talking about
about the great faithfulness of God. Yeah, touching moment. John chapter 10. Um, my mind is blank of announcements. I just want to pray and uh, teach the word because I want to shout, but I can't right now. I got to get the business. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I know it was good to you. It was good to me. I felt it down in my bones. Amen. Sort of like I feel when I hear Tanya Noel sing it sometimes. Make me get up out my seat and I start clapping my hands. Where I'm uncontrolled and I can't help myself. And tears start running and you just want to run around the church. But you know I had to preach, you know, while she's singing. You know? <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, one of those moments, amen. Those of you from Cleveland know what I'm talking about. John 10, starting at verse number 22, let us pray. Our Father and our God, thank you. Um, um, Lord, I don't have the words because I'm excited on the inside. Because you've been so faithful to me. The song was so rich that, my Lord, my nose is running. I just want to talk to you for a minute as we get into your word and share with your people. But I want to thank you first for your faithfulness to me. I don't do right. I mess up. People around me see me mess up. And it humbles me and it keeps my feet on the ground. Thank you for not letting me rise above my own self so that I can fall at your feet and respect your faithfulness to me. Now, oh God, our people need to hear a word from you and I need you to use me and fill me at the same time. Help me now. Um, hearts are heavy in my family praying for my cousin and we're in bereavement as you have taken granny home so I ask that you just strengthen us at this time attitudes are different minds are changing uh, roller coaster ride of emotions is rushing through our churches and our homes because of all of the things in the world now we need you to clear our minds so that we can hear what you have to say to us right now. I pray for all of those that have requested prayer. I pray for all of those that have requested prayer for specific situations. I can't contain them all, oh God, but you have a record keeper in your mind that never misses a word. So we bless you. And we pray to you. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Who I needed that prayer just to just to get myself together. Woo! I, I, I told myself this morning when I was studying I wasn't going to listen to that song, but I just had to hear it one more time. I might I might play it Sunday morning before church starts. Amen. Because uh, it's first Sunday. And who can ever forget the faithfulness of Jesus on the cross. Amen. <laughs> Amen. John chapter 10, starting at verse number 22. Uh, I'm pressing my way to get through both, uh, uh, to get through both sections. This, 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 I am the son of God is a larger section. It goes from 22 to 42. And so now we've talked about the door. We've talked about the shepherd. Now we're going to talk about the son of God. Well, we talked about what Jesus has confirmed. He's the door. He's the shepherd. Now he's the son of God in this context and in this text. Profound passage of scripture. Um, we could stay here till the end of the year breaking it down. Amen. Amen. But we don't want to weary you. We want to help us. We want to help us. Amen. Let us start. After he confirms that he is the shepherd, 
Some say he's crazy, M-A-D in the text, <laughs> he's mad. Uh, and they, and they, and they says he has a devil. Why are you listening to him? That's verse 20. Others said, these are not the words of a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Mm. Whole nother topic. Devils don't heal. Devils cause you to go down. They make you ill. They, devils don't heal. They make you ill. Amen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Let's get in the text. And it was at Jerusalem, verse number 22, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him, said unto him, How long dost thou make us doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, I want to focus in on verse number 22. It says it's the Jerusalem Feast of Dedications uh, for the Jews at that time, what we consider today Hanukkah, and it was winter. Hanukkah is a celebration that history tells us they celebrated because they were able to uh, obtain back the temple, obtain back the area of the temple after Rome had destroyed it. You know, they were at that time persecuting Christians and Rome came in and ravished everything. Okay, so so here it is. It's called the Feast of Dedication. It takes place in December near the Christian Christmas celebration. The feast commemorates a rededication of the temple uh, according to um, Old Testament or, or, or History Testament, I should say history. Uh, Judas Maccabus had desecrated after it had been desecrated by the Romans, Judas Maccabus, Maccabus uh, supposedly, historically, uh, recovers the temple, all right? And so this recovery was in the wintertime, and they call it Hanukkah because they celebrate uh, uh, by getting back the temple, by getting back that temple. Uh, historical fact... Uh, Bears relationship, I don't know if it all does that. Weezer B says it bears relationship, saying, Ye of him whom the Father has sanctified, sent into the world that blaspheme is because I said I'm the Son of God. So this is going all into this section. But it kind of it kind of gives you a backdrop meaning of our Christmas celebration. Jesus was not born in the winter. As a matter of fact, when you look in the text, Jesus was actually born. While the leaves were blooming, it was actually spring. If we look at bloom, if we're talking about bloom, but we celebrate his birth because it was a time when, when, when they were actually celebrating getting back into the temple. Now the temple was very important to them because Solomon's temple was a temple of dedication to God. There was a temple of dedication dedicated directly to God. Wasn't where wasn't where God could live in because God is everywhere. Amen. It was what they dedicated to God. Amen. And they believed, Hebrews believed, that this temple, this temple that was dedicated to God was going to be the sanctuary place where they offered the sacrifices because before they were nomadic. They were moving all around, you know, in tents and trying to find a home. And so by, by the time Solomon gets this temple in a stationary place, they celebrate. Amen. <laughs> All right. But it was taken, torn down, you know, 
this is not the first time. This is a couple times over. Now they celebrate again because they've recovered the temple. They've recovered the, the place of worship where they have a stationary place. So they celebrate Hanukkah because they recovered the place where they worship the Lord. Oh, what a mighty celebration, right? But you got to remember, Romans were, were, were polytheistic, poly, many, many gods. They, 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 they worshiped many gods. So they didn't believe in the monotheistic one God. They believed in polytheism. So that means they, they worshiped a whole bunch of gods. So having a stationary place to celebrate one God didn't mean anything to the Romans. Matter of fact, uh, Christian worship at that time was uh, at a place where it was so frowned upon that it wasn't like people frowning at another group of people or rioting at another group of people. No, 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 no. They were actually killing them, killing them, imprisoning them. If you didn't have a specific skill or something, go back and check the history. If you didn't have a specific skill that could help the Romans, you were dead. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. If you wasn't a carpenter or something, you can do some uh, special. Uh, uh, if they couldn't use you, they killed you. So, so you know, normal uh, wartime stuff. It's you know, it's all in the Old Testament. I'll check your history. Anytime a country comes to conquer a people, the people that are there, they only take advantage of the ones that can help the ones that are conquering, so they can keep conquering. Amen. So, so here we see in this. There's a celebration going on because they recovered the temple from the Romans and it's winter time. All of this is important for a reason because I'm going somewhere. Just follow me. Just follow me. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Solomon's porch was, um, uh, if I can describe it, sort of like my back patio, right? Now, my back patio is not is not covered in. It has a it has a it has a cover over the top of it, but it's open out to the outside. Solomon's porch is similar to that. Uh, for those of you who have back patio, especially with those sliding doors, but on the temple, Solomon's porch was one of the areas that is set up the way our church looks at Holy Grove. If you come to the up towards the pulpit at Holy Grove, it's a smaller section of the church, right? But it projects out because our church was made for sound. It projects out like sort of like this so that so that whoever's speaking in the smaller area can hear wherever they are in the church. No mortar in the building, no drywall. I mean, no drywall in the building. It's all mortar. So it's, it's made for pitch. That's why uh, God is so gracious that when the lights went out or the, or the power went down because of the weather, I could still preach and everybody in the sanctuary could still hear me because the church is made for pitch. And that's how Solomon's porch was. It was made where it had a smaller area in the back and, 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 it, and it was like an amphitheater. So everything went out like that. Amen, somebody? All right. So just to kind of give you the backdrop, but it had a cover over the top of it. Now we are in the winter time, and Jesus goes to Solomon's porch. It was not only a place where he covered himself because of the cold, because of its winter, right? It was also a place where they did public announcements outside. A literal Old Testament amphitheater. Amen, somebody? <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, sort of like the sanctuaries are set up in many churches, just like Holy Grove, right? The smaller area where the where the preacher preaches uh, and then, then that projection that goes out, amen, so that the word of God can go out. Amen, 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 amen. All right, here we go, here we go. Verse 24, then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, how long does this make us doubt? Make us to doubt? Thou be the Christ. Tell us plainly. I like that. You know what I hear when he said when they say "tell us plainly." Uh, 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 I hear that brother, Vicky Winans remade it, but it was another brother that played the organ that made it first. I can hear I can hear her singing. We need a word from the Lord. <laughs> A word from the Lord, just for one word from the Lord. 
who remove all doubt and make the sun to shine, you know, and give you peace of mind. Y'all remember the song. Here it is. Tell us plainly. Verse 25, let's go. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. Watch this. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So notice how Jesus is focusing in on those that say, tell us plainly. But the ones that say, tell us plainly, are the very ones that want to close their ears. <laughs> Ain't that something? They want to hear a word from the Lord. But Jesus is saying, no, you don't. You want to stay in unbelief. Hearing a word from the Lord is not designed to fall on deaf ears. It's designed to make us as human beings make a decision. Let me say that again. Hearing the word of God is not designed to fall on those with deaf ears. It's designed for all of humankind to make a decision. Now, remember I said that because I'm coming back to that. It, the word of God, every time you hear it, every time I hear it, every time a sinner hears it, every time it, it's designed to help us make a decision. Specifically here, a decision of do you believe or don't you believe? Now, Jesus doesn't focus in on the words that he's saying because God doesn't have to prove himself to anybody, but he's got to honor his word. You remember in John 9, they said, why is this boy blind? And God says, Jesus says to them, he is blind so that the works of God might be manifested in him. And the manifestation of God's works is now for these that say, tell us plainly. Because they couldn't believe what they saw. You mean to tell me people can see God work miracles and still turn a deaf ear to him? It's in the text. Yes, yes. They say, tell us plainly, we want a word. Jesus says, I don't even have to tell you anything. You can see what I have done and my works speak for me. Oh my Lord. Any shepherd worth his salt leading a flock, your works should speak for you. I was watching some preaching last night. One of my younger brothers, friend, dear brother, uh, and he was preaching the word of God. And after he got done preaching, I saw him wiping his face with the towel because there were people that were walking down the aisle giving their lives to Christ. That's the goal of anybody who speaks the word of God. Mm-hmm. But the caveat to the speaking of the word of God is not that just the word goes out, but that those who are in sin have a miracle performed in the pew on their lives. They come hearing and believing. Oh, and people see it and still don't believe. He works miracles every Sunday you see a sinner give his life to Christ. Yes, that is a miracle because a walking dead person has been raised 
and made alive. When you and I said to God, I yield, Lord. Uh, we always ask you to raise your hands because one of the things about having your hands raised is that your whole body is exposed and defenseless. And the only one that can protect you is the one you're raising your hands to. That's the real reason of a good shout or one of the real reasons of a good shout. Of a raise your hands moment. Because the miracle that he performed in our lives when he made all of us who were blind come seeing. I'm in the text. Here we go. But these in the text. Jesus says, you believe not because you are not my sheep. Now, Jesus is constantly in this particular chapter, forcing those that think they know to make a decision. Either they are going to accept that he's the son of God or they're going to try and kill him. <laughs> that is the plight of everyone who does not believe. Either they will accept that Jesus is the Christ and God and Savior of their lives, or they will die and go to hell. That's a reality. That is a fact. That is not Pastor Cox saying that you're going to hell. I can't send nobody to hell. I can't send nobody to heaven. All I can do is tell you what the word says. And the word says... Those that have not the son have not eternal life. And eternal life is not what you see, the shell you see teaching the class, enjoying the son. No, real eternal life is being with Jesus for all of eternity. That's real heaven. So I wouldn't care if Jesus was in above the clouds or if he was down on 55th in St. Clair. Wherever Jesus is, and if he brings me with him, that's heaven. Amen, somebody. Because some people say he up. Some people say he down. But Paul says, I was caught up. So, 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 uh, uh, the heavens, uh, the heavens look to the hills. So every, every reference we see in the text says that Jesus has a throne in heaven. <laughs> Amen. Uh, 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 but, but, but he can go where he wants to go. One of the things he did for this blind man is made him come see. And one of the things God did for us it's come down in the flesh to get us because he can go where he wants to go. He doesn't have to do anything. He does it because of great is thy faithfulness. Uh, Lamentations chapter 3, 22 and 23. His mercy is new every morning. <laughs> uh, a loving kindness. That's, what, that's the literal definition of mercy. A, a loving kindness. He loves us so much that he would not allow us, his creation, humankind, to not have an opportunity to come to him. This is opportunity here. So you're going to make a decision. It's forcing to make a decision. But those that hear are the only ones that are his sheep. I'm going, I'm going. 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I know them and they follow me. Um, um. Those of us that hear the word of God had had have 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 and let me let me look and see because Warren Weaserby gives gives us a, a, a 
gives us a really, really, really good definition. Um, our Lord went much deeper in his explanation this time, for he revealed to his Jewish leaders why they did not understand his words or grasp the significance of his works. They were not his sheep. From the human standpoint, we become his sheep by believing. But from the divine standpoint, we believe because we're his sheep. That's right. No man can come to God without the power of the Holy Ghost. And the power of the Holy Ghost works inside of every believer so that we can speak the word of God. And those that hear the word of God, his creation, can make a decision. Okay, I told you, it's decision-making time. It's decision-making time. Either you're going to go with Jesus or you're going to offer to kill him. All right? Now, here is where we see a, 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 a lost person has, has no knowledge of divine election. Yeah. If you are alive and can breathe, God has given you an I. You, I'm, I'm a believer. So you in this case, those of you who are not believers, he's given you the opportunity to understand divine election. If you are breathing, you can be saved. Let me say that again. If you are breathing, you can be saved. I don't have to explain the miracle of your mother and father getting together and all of the million of sperm that has to fertilize an egg and all of that to show that you are a miracle that comes into a word earth, uh, into the earth through a birth canal of darkness and fluid. I don't have to explain how much of a miracle you are just being alive. And the coming alive physically is opportunity for you to make a decision. If you're unsaved, will you go with Jesus or will you kill him? Or in this case, because he's alive and rose again, will you kill you? <laughs> Amen. Because death is not does not mean that you evaporate and disappear. Death means that you will be eternally separated from Jesus Christ. That's no heaven at all. That's actually hell. And in in the text, you know, we, we talk about the devil and Satan. That's not the worst part of hell. The worst part of hell is knowing that you have been listening to pastors seeing crosses in this city and around the cities of these of this whole world and have not given your life to him, have to bow down and still not be with him for eternity. Death, will you choose him? You got this decision making time. Will you choose him? Here it is, here it is, here it is. Everybody that's alive has been elected. Because if you weren't, if if you had if you weren't elected, and you're not alive. God gives opportunity for everybody he gives life to, to be saved. And he knows you already. Yes, decision making. God does it in the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament. Just one popular one that we all talk about. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Is it the God of the idols or? God of this or God of that, or is it God? The one whom you watched perform miracles. And that's when that prophet said, but as for me and my house, we're going to make a decision. We will serve the Lord. Okay, okay, y'all y'all already know. So, so listen, listen. Christ died for his creation. Because I know, you know, we get into that, that, uh, that uh, Calvinism uh, uh, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh -uh, uh -uh. If you're alive and you hear me right now, you can make a decision. Because the Holy Ghost is telling us his word. In the Bible, divine election and human responsibility are perfectly balanced. And what God has joined together, we must not put asunder. 
My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Watch this. This is that. That's the contrast here, because remember these Pharisees and and scribes they tell us plainly. Well, he's getting ready to. Verse twenty eight. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. The first thing that's promised to those that hear the voice of God and believe is eternal life. That's not the only thing that's promised, but it's the first thing that's promised. Mm -hmm. It's uh, what we would call in the business world incentive to live for the one that saves you. I know I'm not worthy to be saved, but because the Holy Ghost pricked my heart, and those of you that believe, because the Holy Ghost pricked your heart, and you and I now believe is the reason we have. It's John 3.16 all over again, right here in John 10, 28 through 30. And I give unto them eternal life. Now, if God gives eternal life, you and I cannot undo it. The only way you cannot have eternal life is if you never believed in the first place. Oh, let me say that again. The one who holds the keys to eternal life is the one that gave eternal life. It's a free gift. Once he gives it, he has the power to keep it until you get with him. He who has begun a great work in you is able to perform it. And what God has joined together, Warren Reasonably says in this context, and we hear it in marriage, uh, let no man put us under. That girl we was just listening to, that young lady we was just listening to, excuse me, was singing at a wedding. Amen. <laughs> right, all right, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Uh, watch this. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, God gives Jesus our souls, those of us that believe. And in order for him to hold us, he's got to be God in the flesh. If he isn't the son of God, there's no way he could contain us because no human can hold all of mankind's souls. No human can hold the saved no human can hold their souls. Let me say that again. No human can hold those that are saved. Humanity can't do it. Only God can do something like that. Here it is. And, and God, and Jesus is going to prove it in his words. Tell us plainly. Remember that. Tell us plainly. My father, which gave them me, is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's. Wait a minute. So you mean to tell me that he has one hand, <coughs> saying singular, his hand and the father's hand. And then he, <coughs> he puts them together, excuse me, I and my father, it's only one hand holding us. I and my father are one. Ah. Uh, Different in function, I was trying, I was pressing, I should say, to explain this to another brother of mine who, who prayed for him. He's a Hebrew Israelite believer. And one of the 
premises is that that really makes me pray for him is he doesn't believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, the son of God. Hebrew Israelites don't believe that God has a son. Okay, we won't deal with that salvifically, but you can deal with it in your own mind because that takes me too far off my point. But I was saying to him, if Jesus is not the son of God, was he lying when he said it? I and my father are one. No, 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 no. Different function. Because Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. But same in essence, I and my father are one, holding the saved in his hand. Whoo! I told you, I said to us, I should say, I said to us on last week, different function, same in power. The one who holds us is the same, has the same power as the one that's keeping us. Holy Spirit. Because right now in the flesh, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, I would have died. Oh my Lord, as soon as I can recall. When I was shaping in iniquity and in sin, did my mother conceive me? I'm just like David. I got to go. Time is well spent. Well, we'll, next week, we'll finish this off. We got to go down to 42, verse number 42. But we're talking about Jesus saying he is the son of God. He's already said he's the door. He's already said he's the shepherd. Now tell us plainly, it's, it's, it's getting them to make a decision. He's saying to them, I'm the son of God. I am God in the flesh. And if you can believe, and I can believe that he's God in the flesh, he's got us in his hand. He's got the whole world <laughs> in his hand. He's not talking about that ball that we see. He's talking about the people that live here. Because this earth is going away by fire. This fleshly shell you see is going to have a new body. But my soul even right now while I'm talking, is in the hand of Jesus. Don't you want your soul to be in the hand of Jesus? Give it to him now, because I preach a lot of unsaved of, uh, of funerals. I preach a lot of folks sometimes, that I preached a lot of funerals that where people were unsaved. After you're dead, you're not in God's hands if you have not believed. Sheep hear his voice. Don't you want to hear his voice? Jesus said, I am the son of God. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you. We bless you. We glorify your name. Thank you for our time with you. Help us, oh God, to understand more and more about you every time we come together like this. Thank you for our church. Thank you for our people. Help us, oh God, to reach somebody who doesn't know you. We love you, Lord. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Let the whole church say, amen. Have a great evening.